Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster and today we're diving in deep on Balenciaga Spring 2022. Buckle up, this is a weird one. If we look here, what do we see? This is such a delightfully weird way for me to start this episode. It's a car, right? But if we look at this objectively, it's actually about 30,000 steel and plastic parts all working together to form what we understand to be car. This is the basic idea behind a gestalt. Gestalt has about five major definitions and it's used in every field from literature to graphic design, but today we're gonna to be dealing with the most simple definition for gestalt that exists. And that is that humans perceive things as more than the sum of their parts. The idea of gestalt is very helpful for understanding how fashion brands make meaning. And if we consider those 30,000 plastic and steel pieces that are working together to create car, then car becomes less of a physical object that has a relationship to the world around us, and it becomes more of an idea. So if you're deep into fashion like me, whatever you have in your head as Balenciaga is actually an idea that is made up of many different moving parts, and those parts go way beyond just clothes, shoes, and bags. And in this show, Demna outlines a number of different clothing references that back up the more conceptual side of what he's talking about here. And if anyone wants, they can read the full show notes down in the description for this video. But what we're gonna be dealing with today is stuff that mostly moves beyond the clothes, the bigger ideas that Demna is tackling. Folks, we are living in the paratext today. Balenciaga's storytelling created by Demna Vesalia has been built lately on demonstrating the potential bleakness of the future and of power and of influence. It's used to demonstrate a post-global warming reality that we will all soon be experiencing. And now here in this show, it is demonstrating the rise of technology. And in adding to Demna's legacy, Balenciaga is showing us all of Demna's worldview on the future here, how the modern world is changing our lives. It's changing our priorities. Will those priorities remain the same or will they change? Will the future of technology change those priorities? This show is affectionately referred to as the Balenciaga Clones Show, and it's affectionately called that because all of the looks are worn by Eliza Douglas, who is an artist and one of the house models for the last few years under Demna. All of these looks are either literally Eliza wearing the looks, or it is another model whose face has been deep faked to look like Eliza. Which of those looks are actually being worn by Eliza, we have no idea. We just have to look at it and wonder. Additionally, the audience wasn't actually in attendance for this show. They were digitally added in. There's also a good bit of rotoscoping, planar tracking, and 3D modeling that's used in post-production. So there's always this kind of subconscious unease when we look at it. And that unease is capped off so well as the lyrics to La Vie en Rose by Edith Piaf are recited by a robotic voice over a very evil, dystopic soundscape. Can you tell I'm losing my voice? I'm having to speak a little bit quieter for this one. Those lyrics is usually rose-tinted outlook on life now sounds more like a dystopic voice commanding you to stay optimistic. Demna is using this show to talk a lot about hyperreality, and there's been whole books written about hyperreality, but the quick definition that we're using for today is an inability of consciousness to distinguish reality from a simulation of reality, especially in technologically advanced postmodern societies. So hyperreality could be something very simple, like looking at the cover of a magazine that's been heavily photoshopped and expecting that your own skin is supposed to look like the skin of the model on the cover. To clear up any misconceptions, adult acne is a perfectly normal part of life and it is nothing to be ashamed of. A more fashion-oriented example might be that for many of the fans of Balenciaga, the brand only exists to them digitally. I talked to tons of you on IG and I've spoken to many folks who live 200 miles from the nearest Balenciaga store in a town where no one has even heard of Balenciaga and they, like me, cannot possibly afford to buy anything from Balenciaga. And so to them, Balenciaga is a digital avatar that represents an idea. It is not a part of their physical reality. I might be using the term a little bit liberally here, but for them, Balenciaga is part of hyperreality. Like when we look at Magritte's The Treachery of Images, we are not looking at an actual pipe, we are looking at the depiction of a pipe. And Demna starts his show notes by making a great point about this. He says, Balenciaga's Spring 22 presentation considers our shifting senses of reality through the lens of technology. We see our world through a filter, perfected, polished, conformed, photoshopped. We no longer decipher between unedited and altered, genuine and counterfeit, tangible and conceptual, fact and fiction, fake and deep fake. 
technology creates alternate realities and identities, a world of digital clones. And that's kind of disorienting, isn't it? Watching something that's live action that didn't actually happen. The, the video for this runway show that is sitting on Balenciaga's YouTube channel, that is the physical reality of this show. There was no real event. The audience did not attend. Most of, if maybe all of the models are being deep faked. And with there being no real physical event, it doesn't correspond to a specific point in time. So me showing you a video file that I ripped of this runway show, that is you experiencing the runway show in as much reality as it exists in. You are literally experiencing the runway show right now. And, and to me at least, this begs a question that I don't have an answer for. Is this show real? Is this a real runway show? I have no idea. And there's a, there's a brilliant moment that demonstrates this phenomenon. It's a, a comment from the original runway video on Balenciaga's channel where someone says, did anyone realize that the audience is wearing the actual line and the models are just a diversion? Now, we do have confirmation of what this collection actually was and we do have confirmation that the clothes themselves are being manufactured. But I'm sure that if Demna saw that comment, he would love the level of confusion that's being caused by this concept that he's proposing. It demonstrates his point so well, I love that. We're gonna do a hard gear shift here because we've talked so far about how the technology itself is changing and kind of looking into the future in that way. We're also gonna talk a little bit about another concept by the same philosopher that sort of started this conversation about hyper-reality. Whose name is... Baudrillard. Baudrillard. I gotta watch out. Pronunciation police keep hassling me. Karl Marx is the cornerstone for this conversation about the use value of an object versus the exchange value of an object. Baudrillard took that concept and evolved it a little bit further so that we could apply it better to a postmodern society. I will explain. I don't think that anyone expected things would end up the way that they have. At the beginning of humanity, all objects would have only had their use value. And that's just the practical value that it serves for you. I am cold, I need a fur pelt so that I can stay warm. But in the early period of us developing civilization, we started to need a different kind of value for objects, and that was the exchange value of an object. This is just stuff like money. A piece of gold doesn't have any real inherent usefulness to it, but we all understand that it does have value and that it can be exchanged in order to take a thing that you do need to use. As people became more comfortable in civilization, we developed a symbolic value for items. And that's just saying, as I was walking home, I was thinking about you, so I picked a flower, so here's the flower. That flower doesn't have any practical usefulness to it, and there is no agreed upon value that can be exchanged for that flower, but it has an emotional importance. I was thinking of you, this is the physical manifestation of my thinking of you. But then we fast forward thousands of years to our postmodern consumer-based information age. We find ourselves discovering a new value system, something the philosopher Baudrillard calls sign value. This is value that's bestowed on an object not for its usefulness, but for what it says about you to others. When we first discovered this new form of value, we used it in the most basic possible way. Fancy cars, nice watches, humongous houses, just objects that communicated to other people, I am rich. That honestly is how the luxury business got started. We had craftsmen who were able to serve the royal families and make them things that would demonstrate the power and authority that they held. But as time went on, and especially as we got into the postmodern world, we developed a much more complex system for communicating to others through objects that we have. A great example of this is a designer I love a whole lot, Carol Christian Pohl, whose jackets and shoes cost thousands of dollars, but as useful objects, just as a thing to protect your feet and something to keep you warm, they're not very effective. They're often purposefully uncomfortable and they break super easily in a way that often can't be repaired. But the sign value of these objects is very complex for others who also know about Carol's work. The point is we, we had built so many expansion packs onto the idea of value that 15 years ago when the internet first was starting to become a part of mainstream culture, it seemed like the possibilities for this were just limitless, that we were gonna develop all of these nuanced ecosystems of sign value and that everything was going to keep expanding outward and that it was sort of gonna go the same path of everything else that's been touched by human creativity, that it was just gonna be a cloud that keeps getting bigger, but it didn't. 
or at least it doesn't seem to be doing that. Because here in the present, in what we think is the final step of value systems, people mostly seem to want the same thing. I mean, you and me probably have radically different taste in clothes than our parents or our siblings. For the most part, within our little subculture of fashion obsessives, it all comes down to us basically wanting the same handful of brands. I think from Demna's perspective, he sees the world is becoming more and more homogenized. One system of sign values gets made and it starts to dominate everything. He would know. He's the head of one of the most successful fashion brands in the world right now. Maybe he's asking himself and others if this is how it's supposed to be. Wouldn't we rather have a world that's filled with the kind of variety that we've come to expect from people and culture? But no. I mean, Knowing the little bit that I think I know about Demna's work, he's probably not asking these very specific pointed questions. He's rather noticed that something is happening, this homogenization of culture and sign value, and he has then repackaged it and given it back to us and asked, does this make you uncomfortable? And I mean, this is a topic that you can find other people talking about. There are definitely other artists and philosophers and writers that, that are covering this topic, but for a fashion designer who is the head of a very successful luxury brand in a market that is, I mean, if you read the business of fashion, the luxury market is slowly shrinking. This is a very risky topic for him to be covering in a runway show. I personally find that very cool and self-aware that he would cover a topic like that when it is in some ways, you, you could see that, you know, the, the suits of Balenciaga looking at him and saying, I don't think this is an appropriate topic for a fashion designer to be discussing. Demna's role never seems to be one of asking clear and pointed questions. It's making an uncomfortable truth so compelling, so mysteriously desirable, that we end up being made uncomfortable by it and wanting to own a piece of it. And I think it's important to specify that I don't think this show is supposed to be like a criticism of the audience. Like, oh, look at you sheep, you're all just out here following trends. I really do think it's more nuanced than that. And I mean, trends have existed for as long as people have existed. I, I personally think that a, a trend cycle-like thing is just literally a part of human nature. I've heard some fashion historians claim that the trend cycle in the 1800s was more fierce and dominating of culture than our trend cycle is now. This show is about how things are growing more and more the same, but it's going much deeper than a simple criticism of the fashion trend cycle. This show is pulling back the curtain on the homogenization of culture in the age of the internet. This homogenization isn't anyone's fault, nor, I guess, is it necessarily bad, but it is very, very different. For example, there's an often talked about phenomenon that the internet has killed off subculture completely. Like if you were a teenager in the UK in 1984 and you went to school, played sports, did after school activities, and you still were like, I hate Bruce Springsteen and I hate sitcoms. I feel isolated and I feel like no one understands me. There was a solution for that. You snuck out and went to a New Order show. Back before the internet, subculture was the only way to find other people who liked other stuff you did. You found people that aligned with your political beliefs, who also hated Bruce Springsteen, and people who dressed like you and inspired you to dress more extremely than you would have dared to do on your own. I mean, there's a reason that we hold pictures like this with such intense reverence. They have a true grit about them that demonstrates that they're from, birthed completely from a subculture, and we look at them and wonder if these people were more alive somehow than we're able to be in our own lives. They're from a time when everyone wasn't on the same wavelength. We look at these videos and images and wonder what it was like to live when there wasn't an invisible international force driving the needle towards universal center sameness. But that is happening now. And I know this is a bit of hyperbole here, but it's definitely how I feel sometimes, that if I'm doing something and I'm not posting it on the internet, there is a part of me that feels like it's not actually happening. And that need to be represented online, to scroll and scroll and then post and then check the likes and adjust accordingly, that need somehow has the unexpected side effect of encouraging sameness in everything, in everyone all around the world. Why is it so effective when Balenciaga does this? Why does this as art work so well? These brooding shows that have a gigantic, yawning, mouth of the void feel to them, Shouldn't this make me feel more fearful somehow? Acknowledging this should be scary. But somehow, when I look at Demna's work, 
I somehow feel comforted by it. And I think that I'm comforted because this is art that's talking about something that I am scared of and it's taking it very seriously. Like this isn't a meme that's pointing to some big hypocrisy from someone or some weird cultural trend and trying to make us laugh at it. Because if I'm being really honest, when I look at stuff like that, even if I do think it's really clever and funny, the emotional reaction that I have to it subconsciously is usually just, <laughs> we are so f as a piece of art, this show and much of Demna's work is acknowledging a deep subconscious fear and in its presentation, it gives it the massiveness and the foreboding tone that it always has in my head. That's such a tall order for a fashion designer. Make a show and a collection about the homogenization of culture through the internet. But here it is. The show gets about the biggest seal of approval that I can give to a piece of art. I witnessed it and I felt it while I was witnessing it. I'm reminded of an artwork by Guido Vanderverf called Number Eight, Everything is Going to Be All Right. It's a video piece where we see the artist walking on an expanse of ice with a massive icebreaker ship directly behind him. To be clear, the artist is in literal, real life, immediate mortal danger in this footage. If that ice breaks further out than is expected, he'll be submerged and he will not survive. But he walks. He knows the icebreaker is behind him but he's going towards the place that's behind the camera, whatever that is. The internet is big, and the personal and cultural repercussions of it are pretty scary. But this is it. This is the world we were born into. And I feel like there's often this pressure on artists like Demna to propose some kind of solution. Like, don't just talk about the problem, tell us what we should be doing. And for me, when I look at Demna's body of work, I feel like it's telling me to keep walking. This is a big one where I need to know what you think. I really wanna get some good discussion started on this one. Please tell me what it is that you learned from this video. We're gonna start doing that for all videos going forward. I want a comment telling me what it is specifically that you learned from this, if you learned anything at all. Even if someone else already said the thing that you learned, I wanna read it in your words. Go join the Patreon. That's the only way this channel is able to exist. You can find the link somewhere on the screen. It's always in the description for every video. Go follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I love you a whole lot and I'll talk to you later.